Hello there. You are watching the press preview. It's a first look at what is on the front pages as they arrive. And in the next half hour, we'll see what's making the headlines with the journalist and author Rachel Shabby and also the former aide to Boris Johnson and broadcaster Culvia Ranger. A very good evening to both of you. Uh, we're going to start by looking at is what is actually on those front pages. And I'll give you three guesses. Uh, there is only one big story in town tomorrow, and that's the historic England versus Italy Euro 2020 final. The Sunday people bring the Lions to life, calling the team the pride of England. And the Sunday Mirror features a heroic picture of England's captain Harry Kane and some of the team's star players as well. And the Sunday Express goes with the Queen's heartfelt message to the England manager Gareth Southgate. The Daily Star turns Kane into a Roman gladiator in anticipation of an Italian conquest. And the Telegraph also quotes the Queen next to a picture of an elated Captain Harry Kane. The Observer pictures a cool and confident Southgate at England's last training session, whilst also flagging public concerns over the Prime Minister's plans for Covid Freedom Day, July the 19th. Well, tonight we are joined by Rachel Shabby and Culvia Ranger. Uh, hello again to you two. I jolly well hope that you're both into your football because there's a lot of it to talk about tonight, isn't there? We're going we're gonna to start, aren't we, with uh, the front page of the Sunday Mirror there. We cane... Be heroes. Very simple headline on the front there. Selection of the three lions on the front. Of course, fronted by skipper Harry Kane. Rachel. Yeah, I mean, it's not the best pun I've ever seen on the front <laughs> of any... Fair but, enough. You know, details. I, I think, obviously, all, all the newspapers are focusing on this and it would be hard not to. There's, uh, obviously, it's been really lovely actually just to see the last few days um the mood in in england and everybody just um having something to feel cheerful about has been just really lovely to behold and i think there's something about this team in particular i don't want to airbrush it i mean i think there has been um some unsavory elements to it as well uh some of the denmark fans uh received some pretty nasty verbal abuse in the match last week uh a lot of the team players have re received some eye-watering racist abuse on social media so it's not all perfect but there is something about this team that have made people want to support them there's something about the way they show up the inclusivity they champion uh the the way that they stand up for things that matter social justice uh standing up against racism taking the knee uh in that fight against racism um and and supporting causes in the country there's a sense that they have created a team that lots of different kinds of people want to support. And that is uh, quite different and quite heartwarming as well. And, and Culver, it's nice, isn't it, to see Raheem Sterling on the front page of this newspaper? Because there's a lot of people who say that given his contribution to the performance of this team, he often gets overlooked. Yeah, there, there has been some talk about that, and sometimes quite rightly so. But, but firstly, let me just say, as a die-hard England fan, and I hope my blazer is giving a bit of a... <laughs> Top marks um, there know, for the Sartoria I'm, I'm Columbia. a true fan who's, who's, yeah, well, who, who suffered through, and you know, my, my England memories go back to Mexico 86, um, the handball or the hand of God, as Diego Maradona wanted to call it, which knocked us out, and the amazing amount of suffering and travesty and bad decisions that we faced, whether it be through penalties in 1990 all through the years of Sven-Goran Eriksson and Fabio Capello, when it felt like we had a, great, a good manager, but maybe not for us. Um, and, and now where we have a team, which has actually, it's not just been about this tournament. This team has been worked on by South, uh, Gareth, Gareth Southgate uh, over a number of years. It's been a four-year process, the last World Cup, which surprised many of us when England got to the semi-finals. But he's built something here. It's not been a matter of the last few months. It's been about four years of 
forging the right mentality, the right approach, the right tactics. Success doesn't occur overnight. We all know that in, in any way, shape or form. So there's been a lot of hard work and that credit must be given to all those people who've been involved at the FA, the coaches, the backroom staff and the players themselves who fought into the, the mentality that's got them to this final. Whatever happens, they've made history already as being the first England team to get to a European Championship final. And, and I'm hoping praying that they'll make history tomorrow by winning it for England for the first time. But as Rachel says, this team has done something very special because all teams, let's be honest, in sport reflect society in one way or another. And this team has had the challenge of reflecting a modern British society, a post-Brexit British society, a society that's been scarred much as the rest of the world has been done by COVID and is looking for something, some something that they could all come together around. And, and it felt like, it's felt like they have done, and this team has slowly, it hasn't happened that right at the start. In fact, there was a lot of skepticism about this team, about the way it would compete, about its capabilities, about the kind of leaders that it held. But they've dispelled that by their deeds and actions on the pitch, as well as how they've behaved off the pitch. This is not a team that's been seen in a dentist chair or out in bars or, you know, doing things that have bought sort of cast a shadow sometimes over previous England teams. This is a team that has done, as Rachel's also saying, stood up for things they believe in, um, yeah. showing the causes they want to fight for. Yeah. And it's been wonderful to see them grow, not just as a team, but as individuals, and hopefully to success tomorrow. You're quite right to point out the way that they've conducted themselves. And in, in fact, that's been something that Her Majesty the Queen, Rachel, was keen to point out when she wrote that letter to Gareth Southgate, basically saying to them, you know, you've got to the final, you've done jolly well indeed, but I really want to commend you on the way you've conducted yourselves. Yeah, and I think that's something definitely that um, people have just picked up on. There's something about that that feels authentic in the sense that, you know, I can remember the image of football as being completely different, you know, just bling and flashiness and you know, just very removed from society. Now, of course, these footballers uh, have lifestyles and salaries that most of us can only dream of, but there's something about the way that they show up and the causes that they support and just the way they conduct themselves that makes it, makes it seem like they are very much still part of society. You know, they're, they're in this society. Um, and I think that is, is tangible. Um, and again, it builds up a connection with people. You can see it in the sort of engagement they have on social media, the kind of the kind of the, the language and the way that they um, engage with their fans as much as the campaigns they choose to champion. You know, we can think of Marcus Rashford and the free school meals, their commitment to donating to the NHS, um, taking the knee. So all of these things combined, they, it does make it feel like uh, a team that, you know, you, it, they're, they're building support, they're building a very diverse and inclusive um, form of support. And I think that is quite different and quite new. Yeah, there's a video, I don't know if you've seen it on YouTube, where they're all trying on their suits ahead of the, the team photo. And just the camaraderie amongst them, they've all got very different accents, they've all got very different backgrounds, but they're all just really good mates and that's lovely to see. I think it's worth pointing out as well, also in the Express here, Colver, uh, talking about the number of of people who are expected to be pulling a sickie if England win tomorrow on Monday morning. And you think bosses need to be worried about uh, people turning up? Well, well, I think there'll be a collective in uh, England, um, maybe productivity dip on Monday, <laughs> both if we win and potentially if we don't, because I think there'll be a lot of emotion that will be drained. I, I, I know after the last few matches and most people are watching, it is sometimes a bit gut-wrenching, the highs and the lows of going through the, the football match and what can happen. But look, we're, we're all hoping for the win. Uh, I think if, if there is a bit of a, a dip on Monday, there normally is quite a boost generally to the country and sometimes even to productivity and the GDP when a country does succeed in these kinds of things. I think the French, when they won the World Cup in 98, felt it for a few months afterwards. I've been reading about that previously. And other countries that, that especially if you host it, if you've hosted, and although England hasn't hosted this tournament, it has worked out in a way where 
uh, nearly all of their matches except one has been have been played at Wembley. So uh, let's hope there's if there's a dip on Monday, there's a more longer term boost over the coming months in <laughs> the summer to the economy as we all celebrate, hopefully, uh, the win in, a, in fine fashion. Yeah, we've got to think long term, haven't we? OK, well, uh, hang tight. We'll be back with you shortly. Uh, coming up, the Lions are, of course, on the world stage with England itching to see if a Euro 2020 win really is coming home. Welcome back. You're watching the press preview with me again are Rachel Shabby and Kulvia Ranger. Uh, hello again to you two. It was really nice, wasn't it, to talk about football in the first half of this press preview because it's nice to have a positive story. We've had, you know, months and months, haven't we, of a lot of difficult topics to deal with. But I, I need to take us back there. If, if we can, uh, front page of The Observer talking about 50% uh, of people still want some kind of restrictions to stay in place uh, in, instead of just removing them all for Freedom Day on July the 19th. And the other one that we cannot ignore is the front page of the Sunday Telegraph, where the new health secretary has given his first interview and he's talking about waiting lists could soar to 13 million. That's about 20% of the population. This is troublesome, Colbert. It is, it is. And look, it's, we're coming back to the point of how have we been through COVID? And at this point, where it appears that the Prime Minister tomorrow will be confirming the announcement that uh, things like wearing of masks and social distancing will be removed from the 19th of July, that's expected to be announced tomorrow there is this question of, well, how is that going to be received by the public? Because we've been inundated, bombarded with messages about safety, about hand space space, about how we need to stay at home, work from home, and all those rules that have been very hard for people to adopt. But eventually, they are absorbed into our psyche, and we've all, we've all listened and done what we've had to do. But it gets to a point that you can't just flick a switch and expect everybody to go back to some kind of normal. It will take time and it will take people's confidence and trust in what they're hearing about why we're now going back, especially when we're hearing messages about cases going up. Now, we understand that there does seem to be, from the figures that are being shown, uh, a break between case rates and hospitalizations and hopefully deaths. So that, that's the justification for where we're heading. But I think there's a lot of work to be done by the government to get the right messaging across to people, to build the confidence that when they say these things, they can take them on board and move back to a position of taking that sense of freedom and ownership of how they feel about going about their daily lives. Yeah, and they, the work as well for the government is going to be looking at those waiting lists, Rachel, rising from already more than 5 million to possibly 13 million people on, a, on an NHS waiting list. Well, that's right. But just to backtrack for a second, um, it's, you know, we've got cases doubling every 10 days and we've got hospital admissions up uh, by 50 percent in one week. If people are anxious about the easing of restrictions, and it seems that half the population does not want that to happen, 73 percent wants mask wearing uh, to continue, according to The Observer, you can see why. Um, I think the rest of the world is looking in on the UK and its plans to release all restrictions on the 19th, just not understanding why on earth we'd want to do that when infections are rising. There isn't another country in the world that has eased restrictions while infections are going up. And when we look at... Um, the hospital waiting lists, which are awful. You're absolutely right. At the moment, that's something like 5.3 million. And by this modelling that Sajid Javid is quoting, it looks to double. We're talking about the same NHS. There isn't like a separate NHS. If infections rise, then hospitalizations will rise and people won't be able to get their, uh, their, um, the necessary care that they need. Already we're hearing of hospitals having to um, cancel operations. Leeds Hospital said that this week it's had to cancel cancer operation surgeries because hospital beds were taken up by COVID patients. So it does seem really perplexing that the government would choose to do this. And it looks like it's 
you know, throwing vulnerable people, vulnerable people under the bus and also throwing young people who are not yet vaccinated mm. under the bus as well. 